Happy Easter, everybody. That we might live in that divine love which excels all others. That one day we might rise by the power of that divine love. We gather together this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So may the grace and peace, may the tender mercy and the hope, the power and the joy of the risen Christ be with each of you. The display of Easter power in today's Gospel comes from the Last Supper table in the shadow of the cross. The commandment that we must love one another for the times we have fallen short, we rely on God's mercy once more. Lord Jesus, you do not call us slaves, you call us friends. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, on the altar of the cross, you lay down your life for us, your friends. Christ have, mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you command us to love one another, that the world might know that you have been sent by the Eternal Father. Lord, have mercy. Christ. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us together to life everlasting. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Ever-living God, 
Help us to celebrate our joy in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and to express in our daily lives that powerful love we celebrate through him who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. And if you would be seated, we are taught by God's word. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, and falling at his feet, paid him homage. Peter, however, raised him up, saying, Get up. I myself am also a human being. Then Peter proceeded to speak and said, In truth, I see that God shows no partiality. Rather, in every nation, whoever fears him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. While Peter was still speaking these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the word. The circumcised believers who had accompanied Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit should have been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they could hear them speaking in tongues and glorifying God. Then Peter responded, Can anyone withhold the water of baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit even as we have? He ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of St. John. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is of God. Everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows God. Whoever is without love does not know God, for God is love. In this way, the love of God was revealed to us. God sent his only son into the world so that, so that we might have life through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as expiation for our sin. The word of the Lord. According to John. Around the Passover table of the Last Supper, Jesus spoke to his disciples and speaks to us gathered at his table this Easter morning. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Live on in my love. You will live on in my love if you keep my commandments, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you all this so that my joy may be in you and so that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Now there can be no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, Jesus says. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you slaves. A slave doesn't know what the master is about. No, I call you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my Father. And you should know this. It was not you who chose me, Jesus says. It was I who chose you. I chose you to go forth and to bear fruit, fruit that will endure, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. This is my commandment. 
love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Last Sunday after the weekend masses, I had a 40-hour window to spend a little bit of time up at Morgan Lake. Uh, so I took it. Uh, just sort of a leisurely drive up there, threw a few clothes in a duffel, uh, grabbed a little bit of food. I figured I could get the rest on the way up and uh, just headed out of town over one of the flyovers on 29 West, catching 32 taking the scenic route to Morgan Lake, going through all those little towns. Some, it's just a bar and a church. Some, it's just a bar. But uh, it was beautiful on a nice Sunday afternoon to sort of amble my way through. Yeah, downtown Pulaski, it's changed a little bit since the big fire there uh, last summer or the summer before. The road is paved going north toward Gillette towards Surrey, around near Underhill and the roads that lead to Neopet and Kashina, Townsend and Athelstane, then the big towns of Lakewood and Wabino Derhe. They're just getting a new pastor, as I understand it, at the end of the summer. And then pressing further north to Leona and Newell and Armstrong Creek, and the last outpost uh, before Morgan Lake, Fence, Wisconsin. It's got its own post office, you know, and its own postmistress, connected in the local bar there, which is the hub of the town. Even more leisurely coming back on Tuesday morning, went west on 64 through Langlade and White Lake, and I think it was Elton, although it didn't seem like there was much in Elton at all. Eventually swinging through Antigo to stop at the wake for Father Charlie Shabusky, who died uh, suddenly. Then back out toward 45 and over to 29. Stopping off at Hoffa Park. They spell it with two F's on the highway sign, but Hoffa Park is only one F, just so you know. So you want to get the extra F out of Hoffa Park if you know what I mean, and back home. And occupational hazards, stopped in a few of the churches that I knew would be open. And I noticed that, uh, like, our, like our church here at Lourdes, uh, their Easter lilies and other spring flowers have for the most part faded by the fifth or sixth Sunday of Easter. But I noticed sort of a theme going on in some of the up north there, hey, churches, in terms of how they decorate. At least a couple of them had this special statue. It's not very big, it's only about this tall. It's a statue of the risen Christ. There he is, standing up. Uh, not much expression on his face, I have to say. Sort of wrapped in a sheet. Hope it's uh, drawn as, uh, behind better than those hospital gowns tend to be. And then he's holding a post with a banner on it, a white banner with a red cross on it. And uh, at, at Antigo, they had it in front of the altar by the Easter candle. It was shorter than the altar table, so maybe about three feet tall. At Hoffa Park, it's a little bit farther off to the side. And I was thinking to myself, looking at it, it's beautiful. But it also seems to fall short, literally, of expressing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, we got the same image uh, behind the tabernacle there. You can go back and check it out after Mass. It's Jesus with the banner, with a little bit more of a white tunic, and with sort of a sad look on his face for being brought back from the dead. And then I realized there are other churches like ours who have more of a sacred heart image, like the one up there behind the pulpit. Jesus, fully clothed, wearing his heart, not on his sleeve, but on his chest. And if you look closely, the wounds in his extended hands and in his feet, they're, they're still there after the resurrection. 
his reaching out, his saying, come to me, you who work hard and bear heavy burdens. And no disrespect, it's beautiful, I love this statue. But he also doesn't seem to me as happy as a risen Savior might be expected to be. Maybe it's what we're used to these days. I mean, with modern photography, especially in the digital age, we can catch so much more expression in people's faces. I mean, did you see Pope Francis this week while the Harlem Globetrotters were trying to teach him the basketball spin? Or he had met with a, a middle-aged mother and her teenage daughter, and there he is holding the mother's face in his hands and looking just radiant, both her and Pope Francis. The twinkle in his eye, the broad, broad smile on his face, the quick word, the greeting, the reaching out, the whatever it is, the scampering around for a 79-year-old man. Maybe by comparison, modern images sort of cause older images to fall short. And I can't believe I'm saying this as an art major, but it's caused me to realize this week that the visual arts, in many ways, are quite limited in expressing what we are trying to wrap our minds and hearts and lives around these Easter weeks. That God's love is so powerful, so, so, so powerful, that any and every sin can be forgiven and that every fear is cast out. More powerful even than death, Jesus raised up from that stone-cold dark tomb, from that rigor mortis stiff stillness, raised up and alive, not static, not just standing there for all eternity like, duh, but alive and full of spirit and full of power and full of love and grace, whatever, however much we need to make us alive. And brothers and sisters, I want to suggest to you that that's the message of the scriptures for the sixth weekend of Easter. That if we're trying to look for the presence of the risen Christ, it's not in art, tall or big statues. It's not in stained glass, here or there. It's not in modern or traditional, younger or older kind of images. That's not what God has planned. No. If the world wants to see where the risen Christ lives, where the victory takes place, the scriptures teach us that it is in you and me. It is in us, in our relationships. And not just a small slice of the human family, did you catch that first reading? Peter to Cornelius? How important it is for us after a year of children being beheaded and adults being crucified and jihad and religious prejudice and polarization increasing all over the globe. St. Peter's words, I begin to see how clear it is that God shows no favoritism. Rather, the person who reveres him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. The Christian person, the Catholic person, the evangelical person, the Protestant person, the Muslim person, the Hindu person, the Buddhist person, the non-religious person. Anyone who uses their wits to seek God and do the right thing reveals the presence of God and is accepted by God. How long is it going to take us as Christians to get that? That that's where the power of the risen Christ lives. Not that we try to convert somebody or change somebody's mind or debate somebody till they fall off their stool in boredom. But to recognize that God is already here, not there, but here. Christ is already risen from the dead. As human beings in the divine image and likeness do our best to find him and serve him and be like him. St. John says it in the second letter too. Love is of God. God is love. And all those who love, love God. 
not just Roman Catholics, not just Christians, but every human being who knows how to love, knows God and reveals God and reveals the power of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. How long is it going to take for us to recognize the risen Christ not in a plaster statue, not in a stained glass window, but in flesh and blood people doing loving and forgiving and humbly serving things. That's where Jesus busts out of the tomb of human fear and human selfishness. That's where Jesus Christ, who would be put to death by the world's violence otherwise, is alive. Is alive. And I would su suggest to you too, brothers and sisters, that this gospel passage points us in a few important directions if we're looking to see what the resurrection of Jesus from the dead looks like. It's probably chosen by, at least in my experience, about 800 weddings so far. I bet 40% of them, 40% of the brides and grooms have chosen John chapter 15. It's an Easter gospel, but it's Jesus at the Last Supper with the cross and the tortures and everything else still ahead of him. And isn't it interesting that he's talking about joy? I tell you all this so that your joy may be complete. Makes no sense in the face of his death. And yet he gets it. He gets it. No greater love than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. No greater love than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. And to do it joyfully and gladly and generously not with resentment, not begrudgingly, to do it with love. Human beings alone can't do that. It is only God's power working in us that allows that to happen. And so those of you who are married persons, who have taken those amazing vows, who have given yourself away to another, to your best friend, to your spouse, husband or wife, you know better than I do. It is a laying down of your life for each other, isn't it? Yes, in the ecstasy and the beauty and the passion and the intimacy of married love, the honeymoon suite, the wedding bed. But those of you who've been married a little bit longer know that it's also other things, like taking care of each other, like putting up with each other like forgiving and being forgiven by each other. This too requires a laying down of one's life for one's friends. Like being there when things are difficult. Like being there when, darn it, he or she is going to sneak out ahead of you. I was reminded going through Pulaski, the first time I attended somebody at their death, it was a man uh, an elderly man and I got called to St. Mary's and his wife was there and he had died suddenly and I was trying to uh, be as comforting as I could and so I asked the, the, the wife, tell me how long have the two of you been married? And she looked at me with a smile and said, 53 years, Father. And then she looked at his body on the gurney, cold and still, and with anger in her voice she said, but he went and ended all that tonight! But she was willing to put up with even that because she had laid down her life for him for 53 years and he had laid down his life for her for 53 years. Or I think of it, you'll see the good news in the bulletin day today. The son of our parish, Brad Vanden Brandon and Jake Searcy, who worked here a couple years ago, they're taking solemn vows on August 28th as Norbertines. Staying for keeps and we're keeping them for keeps. And Frater Jordan, who's working now, he's taken temporary vows, three years, and hopefully then solemns for him. And one of the things that will happen if you go to their solemn profession, at one point the abbot will ask him to kneel down and go spread eagle on the floor. Happens for deacons and priests at our ordinations too. Spread eagle on the floor. I sure hope somebody runs a mop over that floor before we have to put our face in it to go spread eagle down upon it. But it's a ritual expression of what's happening there in religious vows or holy orders. 
that men are willing for the love of Jesus to lay down our lives for others, for the church, for the beautiful, struggling, holy people of God. And if you need another example of where to look for the risen Christ, I would suggest that Mother's Day gives us ample, uh, ample material for reflection. And of course, I'm speaking as someone who has a mother. I'm grateful she's still alive, though pretty fragile these days. But who is not a mother? You who are mothers know this better than I do. So I'm just out on thin ice here. But talk about laying down one's life for those you love. I talked to a first-time mother on Wednesday with her husband. Their six-hour-old little girl was in the bassinet next to them. I liked it. When I greeted her and made the sign of the cross on her forehead, she opened her big brown eyes. She followed my voice along. She started flailing her hands around. I thought, oh, she should be a priest. She talks with her hands, even in the first hours of her life. And then mom went on to tell me she was a little disappointed. She had wanted to do natural childbirth, but at three centimeters, things stalled. And this is all way beyond my experiential skill set. But I'm listening. I'm just trying to report. You know, at three centimeters, things stalled. And uh, she was at the point where she had to ask for an epidural. And then the contractions began to continue. And she was dilated to whatever, nine centimeters. And everything went smoothly. And well, I was ready to pass out with all the details, to be honest with you. But I was just listening. She was the one who laid down her life with her husband's help to make sure that baby came safe into the world. And you who are moms and grandmas, you know how that goes. Whatever needs to be done. Diapers changed, laundry done, up in the middle of the night for a feeding, medical stuff, holding them carefully, carefully, carefully all the time disciplining them, teaching them to pray, bringing them to church even when they don't want to go or they're making noise. That noise is beautiful here. I hope you know that by now, moms. We love babies' noise. Even shrieks and screams, even in the middle of the homily, we love those noises here at Our Lady of Lords. Not to mention all the other ways that moms lay down their lives as a child grows, as a family grows, as finances are secure or insecure, as health is strong or weak. In life and death, many times in big ways, many more times in little, little, little ways, moms lay down their lives for us and empower us to live and bring us to know firsthand not in plaster, not in glass or any other form of art, but in flesh and blood, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Because no one could love like that. No one could serve like that. No one could embrace those humble and tedious and mundane tasks unless the love of God were within her, within Him, within us. And so we rejoice to recognize Jesus right here, maybe sitting right next to us. And we promise to imitate Jesus, risen, crucified, and risen from the dead, by loving one another well, by making the sacrifices necessary for his gospel to be made known. No resentment of the claims that the church has on our time, our talent, our treasure. Willing to share the bishop's appeal, the second collection in Nepal, whatever it is, whatever is required to lay it down. Because Christ lives in us. And will empower us one day to take it all up and more in the resurrection of the just.